Yes, sir, me. I'd like to salute the uh, faculty and the uh, teachers out at the uh, Northern Regional High School in Jersey there. I just received a official uh, mimeographed announcement that the faculty and the PTA are combining on a production that they're going to do for the uh, Parent Teachers Night. Apparently they have a big Parent Teachers Night over there. And uh, I'm invited to it, by the way. The uh, faculty and the parents are going to do a uh, production of O Calcutta, which uh, should be very good. And uh, nobody heard in the control room. They're all looking the other way, but uh, I think that should be very good. The, the PTA over at the Northern Regional with the uh, faculty, they're doing O Calcutta as a class project over there. And uh, I knew you didn't hear it, see? You faked it in there, all you guys. And I think uh, we all ought to go over there. In fact, we already got the uh, TV rights for that. Amateur production can even be more fun than, uh, you know, the professional type because the lighting is different and a lot of other things, you know. So uh, would you please bring me my Hogan Twanger in there? Yeah, that's the, the long one. On the other side, we, uh, with them, well, that's it. Uh, we'd like to salute. That's it. We, we want to salute, if we may, at this juncture here tonight, uh, you know, following the Mets' unexpected and totally passionate victory. We would uh, like to salute the... Uh, well, something that isn't often saluted on this mass medium. We would like to salute the uh, basic beast in all of us. Would you please bring it up there? Uh, here. Uh, I, you don't mind if I play my Hogan twanger here to this. That's very nice. It uh, kind of calms things down. I just feel a little bit better. Got to get the, you know, you got to get the, got to get, get rid of the pipes once in a while, clean the ashes out, and uh, and uh, so incidentally, uh, uh, I uh, see that there's a uh, great quotation here. Not a quotation, actually. It's a editorial from one of the major European newspapers, to be exact. England is England in Europe. Do they consider themselves part of Europe, or is England always forever England? <laughs> Is it an entity unto itself? Yes, blood, sweat, and tears. However, uh, this blessed isle. Hey, it's not bad, isn't it? I do that very well. This blessed race of men. That's not bad. Uh, and uh, I would like to say this, a uh, little editorial at the, uh, one of the Dons, I believe at uh, Cambridge. He's angry. He says that the people have killed swear words by their constant use in plays and in books. They have emasculated them, which is kind of interesting considering that, uh, you know, what the word emasculation means and what most swear words refer to. But uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's an act, apt word. And he says that uh, he wants to see a revival. He says the four-letter words are now emasculated. And I agree with him. I mean, little 12-year-old girls are using them in their poems, you know, and that kills the whole idea, friends. It just kills it. I mean, just so dead. D-E-D. And uh, he said that uh, that uh, what he would like to do is to see a revival and uh, a more general usage of the better three-letter obscenities. And uh, I agree with him there. In fact, I can only think of, let's see, one, two, three, four, four really choice three-letter obscenities. Can you think, uh, how many, can you add any to the basic four Total obscenities that are three letters? Or are you trying to think of the first four? <laughs> oh, I'm living with a whole crowd of innocents here. Whole crowd. You know, uh, come on, come on. Get, get, get closer here, gang. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, get, 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 uh, get, get closer now. now. I'll give you the cue there, Corny. Don't, don't, don't tip the gaff there, as my old buddy uh, Long John would say. Now, I want you to gather around real close here. I want you to stand to the stand here, and I want you to keep a sharp eye on my hands. 
You watch these hands, and I'm going to move these walnut shells back and forth here. Now, I want, want you to be able to tell me. I, I'm sure, look, you see this P here. You can see it. I want you to be able to tell me just what walnut shell has the P under it. Now, watch carefully. Move it to the left. Move it. All right, now, for the one who can guess that, I will give him the chance to order some of this magnificent silver polish, which uh, not only doubles as a deodorant, it also is a magnificent detergent. And uh, so step right up now. Here we go. Here we're going to move them shells around. Now watch it. Now watch careful. And keep your eye open. Here we go. say here was, uh, of course, uh, a lot of things uh, that a lot of them I can't say. And by the way, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of obscenity, we'd like to report from uh, one of my favorite New Jersey towns, and, uh, you know, you have your favorites. Uh, and I, I uh, did you ever get a, 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 a attached to a bad tooth or something? You know, you get so that you kind of like it, and you just keep running your tongue over it and all that, and uh, get kind of used to it. It gives you something to do when you don't have anything to do. You sit there, and you you know, you try to get the celery out from under it or something. And <laughs> it gives you something to do. And uh, eventually you get it taken out and you get it filled and you miss it. You miss the hole in it. Well, that's the way I like New, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. And uh, we have a little note here from uh, uh, the News Tribune of Perth Amboy, New Jersey. That's a beautiful town, Perth Amboy. And, uh, it's it's it you truly it says Perth Amboy is why they call New Jersey the Garden State. It's just beautiful, and uh, Perth Amboy, New Jersey, the News Tribune. They have a little note here by Sue Evans, who's a reporter there, and she reports on another development in the, the continuing fight of the individual to uh, fight whatever it is he's fighting. <laughs> he can't figure it out. See, and, uh, in this case, the fuzz, New Brunswick. Quote, I think if you can't express displeasure to a police officer, you're no longer in the United States of America, District Court Judge John E. Bachman said in overturning the conviction of a Woodbridge youth accused of using a four-letter Anglo-Saxon expression. Bachman found this guy innocent of using loud and offensive language and of failing to keep his car in the right lane on Route 35 in Madison Township last August. Although uh, this guy and his wife denied using the word, Bachman said he believed New Jersey State Trooper Leonard Lujak, who made the twin arrest. Uh, Trooper Lujak quoted the defendant as saying, and we quote, in true Jersey uh, forward uh, pungent talk, a true Jersey native expressing himself. He's hanging his head out the window, seeing the cop comes up, and he says, Oh, look, where do you think you're going? You know, woo! The U light is flashing, and the guy's on Route 35, which is one of the magnificent routes in Jersey. And he sticks his head out the window and he says, What the blank is wrong with you people? He hollered at the cop. However, he was hollering because he was stopped for the second time at the same cop in a five-mile stretch of the highway. <laughs> but the judge said that even if the youth, isn't it interesting how everybody's called a youth? He's got his wife with him. Everybody, he says, uh, he said, even if the youth did use this word, he had violated no law. Quote, certainly the word involved here is not one that I want my children to hear, but it is one that I've heard, and I do quite frequently hear in conversation. In this day and age, the judge said, an ex-Marine, the judge went on, he said, in the armed forces, the word has become an expletive, and its use generally in male circulation is very high. I wonder what word he's talking about. Gosh darn it. That's a, uh, Maybe that's it. Or uh, fiddlesticks. According to attorney... Uh, Harold A. Cuskin, who was counsel for this guy, and assistant prosecutor uh, Peter A. DeSino, uh, Judge Bachman remarked, I don't think I would shock either of you guys, either one of you, if I heard it used at the bar, at meetings, and 
I think both of you have, too. I've heard it in the corridors of this courthouse, on both sides of the courthouse, used as an expletive. Say, that's a racy court over there. <laughs> I mean, I fr frankly haven't heard it used in court. They just, I don't find anything wrong in any driver of any motor vehicle that's been stopped twice in five miles being upset and expressing displeasure to the police officer who has stopped him. This is the judge. I don't think this man was doing anything more than expressing his displeasure. Dum, da dum, dum. Well, things are changing. And, <laughs> I mean, when you could say groovy stuff like that to cops, what next? You know? You know, I mean, and then the judge gets on the cop for complaining about it. it says, so, yeah, I, oh, I'm not putting it down. I'm just putting it down. Now, what word am I using? Well, if you're interested, we'll send it to you. By the way, uh, uh, a lot of things are happening everywhere. It's groovy, a lot of great stuff. For example, uh, uh, you know, some, some things, are, speaking of obscenities, because obscenities are creeping everywhere. Uh, the word has almost lost its meaning. Obscenities. And, uh, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, what kind of a mind have you got? I, well, there was no connection there. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, George, no, this is an honest, upright, sober, industrious, sound, basic bulwark of, this, of the uh, community radio station here. And we're very deeply concerned over each and every one of you. Uh, incidentally, the latest uh, victim of uh, repression on the Cornell campus is not the student body. As coerced by the administration, this, by the way, from the Cornell University paper, I have spies everywhere, friends, or even the ROTC is coerced by the SDS. The latest victim is, oh, would you please give me some marching-type music? That's it. All right. Oh, the, the, the latest uh, uh, of the victims of coercion is the Big Red Marching Band. <laughs> Oh, the big red marching, marching band. Let's go together now. Oh, oh, that big red band. Oh, oh, a Cornell overlooking the lakes of Cayuga. Not a few. Oh, that big red marching band sure can wiggle. Ba -ba -boo -boo. And it's laying it down out there on the field today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was down, down at St. James and Family. Ah. Oh, that's enough, that's enough. I want cut one, side one on that recording. And now, why was the, uh, now nobody seems to be uh, curious about this. The big red marching band was, uh, changed its show because it was called Obscene. <laughs> Their show. <laughs> and I wonder where they got it. I've been doing this bit for years on the air. There must be somebody connected with the big red marching band who listens to the show. All right, you want to hear what happened? Uh, three members, this happened at, at the Cornell Rutgers football game in New Brunswick. New Brunswick is in the news east. And uh, three members of the university's board of trustees happened to be at that game. And they found a segment of the band's show particularly irritating and obscene and objectionable. All three protested in writing to the president of the university. And uh, why it is? Well, it's just a disputed version of the show. Happened when the band assumed the formation of a gigantic hypodermic needle. You remember that? I've done that on the show. You remember that, Corny? You were down at the, the limelight when I did that. Well, and I even suggested one day that bands were going to do wild stuff. You know, and they're going to really, they're going to stop this business of making a big block C, you know, marching around or making a locomotive. <laughs> with the smoke coming out of the chimney. And they're going to make some real, real stuff, see? And anyway, this disputed portion came when the band marching their plane. And usually, of course, these bands, they don't play marches or anything anymore. They're usually playing stuff like, uh, you know, the, 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 the theme music to uh, a Gypsy Rose Lee uh, retrospective. Uh, it's all showbiz now, see? So the band starts marching around there, and they make this big hypodermic needle. And then the, uh, according to the script, right over the PA system, the relatively simple problems. And now, the big red band, you know how they, and now the big red band will salute the uh, Cornell's Gannett Clinic, which treats uh, accidents and give shots to the students. And they make this big hypodermic needle. However, the script didn't stop there. It went on to say, now get ready in there, Corny, watch me carefully, ma'am. It went on to say, uh, Cornell's doctors at the Gannett Clinic at the University and must now deal with the more complex issues of prescribing contraceptives for women. With that, the band broke into... <laughs> with that, they played I Got Rhythm. <laughs> and 
You want to hear my new juice harps? These are brand new ones. And uh, these were brought to me by a friend from Europe. And these are very rare, handmade, Austrian-type juice harps. And I will play them seriously tomorrow. This, uh, you want to hear the different sounds of them? This is an Austrian juice harp, a good one, handmade. Boy, listen to that. Boy, listen to that. Boy, listen It's a beauty, isn't it? Now, here's another one uh, of a very different type, and it's also Austrian, but listen to the difference in tone. You'll hear this one, uh, Corny, with her. Man. And now, the larger one, also an Austrian Jews heart. Listen to that sound. Yeah. Oh, you like that one, huh? Oh, yeah, but it takes a man to play it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can hardly wait to you know, break these babies in. Uh, speaking of uh, breaking them in here, I would like to salute. You know, there's a lot going on in colleges you now with the bands going out there marching around. And uh, did you hear what happened uh, at Temple? I'd like to salute Temple here. Underdog Ralph M. Hintle has done it. This is the Inquirer, the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the great humor papers in America. And uh, it's, uh, I'd like to salute Philadelphia out there. It says, uh, Underdog Ralph M. Hintle has done it. This is by Al Haas of the Inquirer staff. On Monday, he was elected Temple University's big man on campus, BMOC, beating out candidates from 1,200 fraternities. In winning the annual contest, Hintel not only scored a decisive and uh, complete upset, he made campus history. Hintel, whose name means dog in Yiddish, is a dog, an eight-year-old mongrel, won the BMOC title. Hintel belongs to Alpha Chi Rho fraternity. He's been a frat house resident ever since his recruitment as a pup from the SPCA. He was entered, and uh, 12 guys ran from this for the whole thing, see, and the old Hintel took, it to, to, you know, took all the marbles. But this is nothing new at Temple. And by the way, he won handily uh, also. <laughs> it's just he did very good. And uh, you had to vote for him by dropping money in a can. I mean, you couldn't just go out and vote. You had to, and he won uh, $115 worth of votes. So, you know, he must be a pretty good mutt. And uh, the student body earlier this month elected Margot France, their homecoming queen. Margot, a 19-year-old sophomore, is really Mark France. A... Sort of. But that nevertheless, old Margot won and Hintle won the BMOC, so things are going real good up there, Temple. <laughs> now, that, that reminds me, though, uh, you know, this business of uh, making bad uh, stuff. I shouldn't tell you this story because uh, even now the guilty are still walking around. And I don't want to involve the guilty in anything. Uh, would I out there, you, guilty type? Anybody guilty out there tonight? Dump, da dump, dump. I mean, anybody? Sure, of course. We're all guilty. We're all guilty. And I feel the great, terrible guilt of mankind's eternal sins gnawing eternally at the uh, at the internal internalisms of me, internally. And that uh, isn't that making sense, is it to you? All right, let's start from the start. We'll go from the start again. Would you please play the theme? Please play the theme there. We'll start from the start. All right. That, okay, new show. Let's start from the top. 
Didn't understand nothing I said. Ah, pearls before swine. Bring it up there. And now we bring it a piggly hour. That's right. We're going to sit here and plumb these pearls before swine. Come here. Come here. Oink, oink. Come on, piggly. Here's a pearl for you. Let's try that one for size. Uh, All right, that's enough. That's enough, you confounded knave, fool and idiot. It won't be long before it's all going to happen. It's all going to happen, all of us. Don't you forget it. And I'm going to be right here laughing. <laughs> I mean, if the Mets can do it, so can the Astros. Then you're going to cry, man. I mean, you're all in favor of an underdog winning if you... Yeah. Remember that. Everybody's saying the underdog's going to do it. And one day the Astros are going to come to town. Oh, look out. Oh, look at that. My coffee cup sprung a leak. Nothing worse than these cheap coffee cups they've got around. Look at this. It's sickening. Get a rag quick. Hurry up. Hurry up. Help. It's coming on me. Help. Help. Oh. Uh, here comes. Oh, that's no rag. A couple of people. That's going to just spread it, you idiot. What a klutz. They're putting paper all over the place. You know, that's just spreading it all over the whole. That's all right. Go ahead. That was a nice try, but the... go ahead. Get out of here, will you? <laughs> nice try. Well, it's Friday night. You know how Friday night is. Tomorrow night, there's going to be a... You know, I I, I, I kind of miss baseball season already, don't you, Corny? There's no... And, and it's it's terrible now. You come into the station here, and the engineers have got nothing to watch. Uh, you know, the television sets are all turned off, and the engineers, for the first time in months, have been forced to listen to the programs that they're engineering. And, of course, this, <laughs> this causes a lot of problems here. And uh, Oh, yes, everywhere you go. Have, have, you know, it's funny. May I say one more thing about that Met thing and then forget it for a year? I mean, I'm not going to continue to... Have you noticed two things? So long, Keith, it'll be all right. All right. You stick with the fish, man, and you'll start thinking good. All right, so long now. Have you noticed that... Uh, that... Uh, it's funny how all of a sudden political candidates have developed a fantastic interest in baseball. Isn't that interesting? And I just remember, it just seems like a short time ago they were all Joe Namath fans. <laughs> oh, man, it's fascinating, isn't it? And, and, uh, and uh, I, I saw one of the papers on the back. See, it shows this great big celebration in, uh, you know, in the, in the Mets uh, and that's dressing room. It shows a big celebration. These guys are pouring champagne. And who's right there in the middle getting champagne poured on the top of his head, you know? Above it, it says, Lindsay and the Mets, do it! I thought, well, that's a nice trick. That is a nice trick. <laughs> and I, I think that's okay, you know. It's all right. I mean, if he can get away with that, that flim flat, I don't mind that one. But uh, yeah, I, on the other hand, uh, uh, I, I notice, I notice uh, you know, you, you looked out of the window here at the station... And you could see this. It looked like the whole city had snow on it. It did. It really did. It was fantastic. And anybody who tells me that baseball is dead, well, I remember when the Jets won the championship, there wasn't anywhere near this kind of celebration. You know, it was a little, uh, you know, a little yelling down two shores, and uh, you know, a couple of guys in Madison Avenue joints, you know, where Joe hangs around. It was a big deal. But I didn't, I didn't see people, you know, throwing paper out of the windows. Why? In fact, they threw three secretaries out of the secretary pool. They couldn't find anything to throw. And so uh, one building right down the street, you just threw three secretaries out in the street, 42 floors, you know. Well, they had a lot of them hanging around the pool there. And they wouldn't, you know, half of them couldn't type anyway. And uh, so <laughs> out the window they went, see. Well, uh, I thought this was kind of exciting. And uh, and I I, I, uh, I wonder whether, of course, uh, Milt Gross is going to be writing uh, next August, baseball is dead when the Mets are in eighth place. You know, <laughs> baseball's dead again. Dum, 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 dum. Well... Six and one half does the other. But one time I'm in this band, see, and I'm, I'm reminded of this thing. One day we're out practicing. You know, may, it may never occur to you, but bands practice fanatically. I mean, maniacal practicers. You, know, you don't make a hypodermic needle right in the middle of a football game without practicing, you know. And everybody's got to know where he's going to go. And, and it's all got to be done with a beat, see. And uh, you, you march and you, you make your eight steps this way and you turn left and you take three more steps. And then you turn right, you do a right pivot, and the big horn is there, and the wind is blowing. And so you do all this stuff, it gets kind of exciting, you get involved in it. Most people don't think in terms of watching the halftime band uh, celebration, in terms of how it feels to be in the band, you know. They're throwing everything they got at it. Well, actually, most bands feel that the football game really is a, is a medium for the band show. 
that the, that the big moment is, of course, the show, the band, when you come marching out. Of course, this is called centralism. We all have a little of it inside of our gut. And, and you ask any football player on the team, on the field, what is the most important position? And it's a fantastic coincidence. Almost all of them will name their position. Uh, yes, it's very important. The coach thinks that the no football team will win without a good coach. And uh, the trainer says, uh, you know, I'll tell you. I remember I was talking to Spike McBullet. used to be coach not Alabama. And he said that uh, that uh, he credits his ball club with maybe four or five wins a year because of the coach alone. So we used a Sloan liniment, you know. If you don't use Sloan's liniment right, you know, you get it in guys' eyes. And someone had to, they drink it. I remember one time as a halfback, used to drink that Sloan's liniment. Never did get out a football game. Well, I, I fixed that, you know. I used to lock up the Sloan's liniment, and by God, they started to win. Now, who won that game? Was it the halfback or the coach? I say it's the coach. And and, and after the coach comes the, comes the trainer. Well, now, you ask uh, you ask big uh, Klutz McGonigal, All-American center, uh, what's the key position on the team? And Klutz, uh, if he's in one of his more articulate moments, uh, Klutz, you say, Klutz, uh, uh, what is the most important position on the team? We, we, we. Well, what uh, position uh, do you think is a key position on the ball club uh, in winning the games, Klutz? Key, what's, what's key mean? Well, uh, what's the most important position, uh, Klutz? Uh, you put me on. Well, no, Klutz, I'm not putting you on. I don't believe that. So don't, don't, don't think that. Uh, what is the most important position on the team is all I'm asking for all of our listeners out there watching the wide, wide world of sports. The uh, center. I mean, if the center, if you, if you center don't hand the quarterback the ball good, uh, what happen? They can win no game and push them over. Well, center got to hand the ball back. And uh, he got the ball and say, and the quarterback all on them things, I hand him the ball. And if I don't handle the ball, what happens? They fumble, and then we lose the game, right? So you you know what uh, position is the right one. That's a sender hitting you in the mouth. It's my guy. Well, Al, thank you, uh, Klutz McGonagall, All-American candidate, and uh, also he holds uh, an M.A. In, the, in psychological engineering, and uh, he's uh, going to go on into the pro ranks very shortly. Very good, and thank you very much, Klutz McGonagall. Thank you. And now we return you to Jim Jim who is going to take you to Garmisch Partenkirchen for the ladies' backward, bottomless ski jumping and barrel rolling championship. Come in, Jim Jim. Well, now, that's a typical, um, <laughs> you know, moment in sports. Now, if you ask the average band member, he will tell you that the most important thing in the afternoon is when they made that big block L or D or Q or, the, or the, you know, the big, they always, uh, you know, with the, with the, with the uh, big moving uh, locomotive with the smoke and uh, all that. Well, one day, <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, one day I was with the band, and there was a splinter element. I, I in every in every organization, I don't care whether and no matter what organization, the Supreme Court. There are two or three wise guys you will find. Now they may not look like wise guys. They all sit there with their robes, look very official. These guys sitting up there. Well, I can guarantee you, out of that nine guys, there's two of them that are, you know, wise guys. Among the other. Yeah, there's always a splinter group in every group of men. Have you, haven't you found this true? I mean, uh, and so in the band, now when you sit up there and you watch the band, you think the band is uh, just a large number of guys who, uh, who uh, you know, they're out there, the old victory song, and the, you know, purple victory, and they do their annual salute to uh, Rogers and Hammerstein or something. Oh, no, there is a splinter group. Within every band, and I unfortunately, due to my makeup, I've been. I, I listen. I was the first guy in my class to laugh out loud at the Reader's Digest. I don't know why. I just found it very funny. You know the article that says I discovered true life and total happiness when they told me that I had leukemia. You know those the, the, the articles. Yeah, that's just a typical. Reader's Digest, or in spite of being a two and a half foot high measure, I won the high jump at the Olympics due to positive thinking. Thank God for Dr. Peel. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Well, I, I, I just was that way. I wish I was more, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I wish I was a believer. I, I, I do in a lot of things. I mean, for example, the, most guys who think they're not believers are really believers because the one thing they believe totally is themselves. Every iconoclast that I know that works. 
you know, working iconoclast. Like uh, I, I was with Mort Sahl the other day. He thinks that he doesn't believe in anything. No, don't you believe it? He believes that he's the greatest talent, believe me, since St. Peter. <laughs> I mean, he does. And uh, so, so you're not really an iconoclast. A true iconoclast is the guy, he'll laugh at himself first and then take on all, all the rest. Well, Chris, he'll never get a good agent. Because uh, <laughs> he'll wind up laughing at the agent. So, uh, nevertheless, I'm, I'm uh, sitting in class there, seeing we go out one one afternoon. It was a Friday night. You see our our football games that we used to when the band. I was in the band in my freshman year. And we used to we used to play our freshman football games. I was in the freshman football team. We would play our freshman games in the afternoon, and then we would march at the varsity uh, that night. You know, so uh, I'm out there one afternoon. It's a cold, brisk afternoon, fall like this, and the, the band is out there making our block letters, and we're making the locomotives, and the, the uh, cheerleaders are out there together into the field, and they're doing their bit, and the rain is coming down. And I'm sitting with, with a guy named Snuffy. I've never discussed Snuffy, have I? You know what Snuffy had? Snuffy was the best bass player I ever knew. And he looked like what everybody would think a good bass player should look like, you know, a, real, a really good sousaphone player. He was fat and round, and he had this round face. And uh, Snuffy had a huge chest that just filled up his, his sousaphone. The thing, the thing fit him snugly like a kid glove. You know, it was like he was born wearing his sousaphone. And old Snuffy would sit there, and he, he played his sousaphone with, with uh, pizzazz, with a land. You know, he didn't just go, oomp, 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 Not at all. Snuffy would play his sousaphone. Well, you know how Paul Desmond plays the alto? He always sounds like he's putting everybody down. You listen to Desmond, he's got that put-down quality in it. Well, Snuffy was one of the very rare put-down sousaphonists. He could play the Stars and Stripes forever. And we had a, there's a fantastic uh, sousaphone part of the Stars. You know, the boom, boom, you know, I could sing it for you here. But Snuffy would play it so that Mr. Dirks, the band director, would give him a hard look. And he's playing every note. It's just the quality with which he played it. It was snide. It was like he was secretly cackling at the Stars and Stripes forever when he's playing. He was a very great sousaphone player. So Snuffy is sitting there with his feet up, and uh, we're waiting around for uh, the band director to come out. We had this guy that would direct our maneuvers, and he's sitting there, and it's raining slightly on the sousaphone. And I, one thing I remember about, the, about Fridays, uh, particularly, well, even Thursdays more so, was taking that damn sousaphone home, and, and cleaning it with Bon Ami. <laughs> Boy, there's nothing to sit for about five hours and polish the bell of your sousaphone all the way down. So you get this thing all polished, a beautiful man, and shining. And within five minutes, it starts to corrode. And you see the little fingerprints all over. But the, here we are sitting in the rain. And this rain is coming down. Snuffy sitting there with his sousaphone. And with him is uh, Roger Bean Blossom, who was in the uh, trombone section, Billy Hartzell who, uh, by the way, played uh, the oboe. And there was a couple of guys that were in the drum section were all sitting there. And this is the splinter section. About a half dozen. There was Bob Wagner, who played the clarinet. And Snuffy says, hey, listen, you guys. And with that, Roger Bean Blossom, who played the, who played the trombone, Rod says, uh, what do you want? And it's not a great Indiana name, Roger Bean Blossom. So he said, what do you want? And Snuffy says, let's do some maneuvers. He's got his horn. And... Uh, and Rod says, what, what do you mean maneuvers? He says, let's make some groovy stuff like they'd never make in the band. He says, hey, let's make our own for a while while we're waiting. And all the rest of the, the you know, the, the uh, Reader's Digest type band members are sitting down at the other end of the field there with the, you know, the straight thinking guys. So, <laughs> yeah, the, you know what I mean. And so Rod says, what do you got in mind, Snuffy? And Snuffy says, well, uh, what do you think most that you would never see the band form? And they blow the whistle. And uh, we formed something there. What do you think would cause the most riots in the stand? And Rod says, oh, come on, we don't have enough guys to form nothing like that. He says, what do you mean? We've got a couple of other guys. We, they, don't, they don't know what they're forming. We just tell them where to march. So we called over about a half dozen other guys. Hey, come on, we're going to try something, you guys. So they fell in, innocent ones. See, there's always innocent guys that get pulled in on every plot. Every plot. And so Snuffy, who was this really smart guy, and that real snide character, so Snuffy says, all right, I'll tell you guys what you do. When Raj gives the signal, he says, Raj will blow the signal. Well, you guys, in columns of threes, I want you to march this way, and you go this way. And he says, you go over there, Fred, and over there, Bob, and Harry, and all that. 
And he says that and Pete was the squarest of them all. Pete Kuyper, at the age of 17, was bald and he wore gray suits. I'm serious. Now, he, he, yes, he was, he was the, I'm, I'm telling you, at the, age of, at the age of 18 already, he was a senior member of the Junior Chamber of Commerce. And by the time he was 22, he was in the Senior Junior Chamber of Commerce, and uh, he was retired at 23. And he lives in an old people's home somewhere. But uh, he was that kind of guy, see? So he says, now, look, Pete, I want you to go that way. Pete is a conformist. He does what you tell him, see? And then he was in awe of Snuffy anyway, because Snuffy had won about nine gold medals playing that crummy sousaphone. So Snuffy was good, see? So Snuffy says, you go that way. And uh, here, Schwartz, and Schwartz was in the maze. He says, you stand up. And Schwartz was another innocent. I was in on it. So was Roger Bean Blossom <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and Freddie Roller. We were the only three who knew what, what Snuffy was making. And so here we're out on the field, this, this nice, pris, very brisk kind of a fall day. And uh, Roger gives a signal. He goes, quack, quack, on the, on the horn. And with that, Shaughnessy, we had a guy named Fred Shaughnessy who played that trap. And he goes, he gives the beats. And we start marching out. And Snuffy is directing. He says, all right, a little bit to the left. Hey, uh, hey, come on, Bean Blossom, pull over to the left. Uh, now dress it up over there. Come on, Kuiper, pull over there. And we had marching down the field the most fantastic, obscene signal you ever saw in your life. And you could see it, see, if you were far away. But if you were in the band, you couldn't tell what you were making. You could just see the guys all around you, you see. <laughs> and here we had marching right down the middle of the football field. This total obscenity. Well... Well, you see, the school was right next to this field. And anybody who was up on the second floor or the third floor could look out, and guys used to look out and watch the band practice. You know, and all of a sudden, there's a big crowd watching the band, and they're looking out, you can hear guys yelling, and the band, <laughs> the Splinter Group, is marching along. <laughs> and they marched on the field. And Mr. Wood, who was the assistant band director, he came, Terrence, somebody had called him up down in the band room and said, you ought to see what the sousaphone section is making out on the field now. And I imagine he says, yeah, they're making a block H. Block H, my foot, man. They're making a block you-know-what. He says, you better get out there quick, because every chick in the whole school is standing up on the third floor cheering this thing. It's unbelievable. Well, he came tearing out, and he couldn't see it. He's on the he's on ground, on, on, on ground level, see? He comes running out, and he says, what are you guys making? What are you guys doing? What, what, what are you practicing? Of course, instantly we break up. And then there was that fantastic pregnant moment when Miss H. McCullough, who was the our resident blue nose, she came running out on the field. She taught English. She had seen it. And she says, I have no idea what the young girls of the third group thought when they saw that awful thing on the field. And Mr. Wilson said, what awful thing? She says, it's terrible. Well, it was the first time that the band had gotten public acclaim. I mean, nobody cheered when we made Block H's and locomotives. All of a sudden, every chick in the school was out there cheering what we made. And not only that, every other guy was, truck drivers were stopping and cheering, you know? Great moment. And Wilson turns and he says, what were you guys making? Snuffy says, well, I don't know. We just out practicing, doing marching. And uh, Miss McCullough says, that's not true. You know what you were doing. Well, to boil it down to its basic components, 36 guys from the band were suspended for two weeks. We all had to bring notes from our mother saying we'll never make anything like that. That was very difficult to explain to my mother because she asked us what we made. And I said, well, we just made this thing out there. <laughs> and that the, if what was so sad, though, was Pete Kuyper, the squarest of the square, was thrown out of the band for two weeks because of incipient marching band obscenity which he found very difficult to explain to his father. His father, who was born wearing, wearing uh, Oxford gray jockey shorts and never saw reason to change. And, uh, but then again, uh, who knows, you know. It's, uh, it's, all in the, it's all in the eyes of the observer, friends. You shall see what you shall see. And uh, somewhere tonight, the big red band of Cornell. What is the name of the place? Cayuga's Waters? That Cornell hangs around there? I understand they're even more polluted than, oh, well, that's something else. I'm not here to, you know, <laughs> I'm not here to talk about one man's pollution. One man's pollution is just another man's garbage. It's all his friends. So each man has to, you know, pick and choose out of this world, do the best he can. And by the way, uh, over the weekend, why don't you try just hopping down on one foot once in a while? See where that gets it going. Uh, hang by your, uh, 
Oh, shucks, I forget. Six at one happens to bring it up there, big corny. Easy boy, easy there, easy boy. Oh, incidentally, for those of you who are band directors out there, and you'd be interested to know what we formed in our little band rehearsal, uh, you must be over 21 and a bona fide, qualified art student. To send your name and address to uh, John Philip Souza, in care of this station. That's John Philip Souza. And you can spell Sousa anywhere you care to. It's all funny, no matter how it's spelled. This coffee cup is leaking again. Yeah. Almost unplugged all the out there. Gala Moffrey. 